Hi, I'm Sarah Whitehead and this is Jackson and I'm very pleased to be able to present a recording of my most recent webinar Signals of Preemptive Aggression. If you haven't seen it before it's a little over an hour in duration and I do recommend that you stick with it right to the end as I have a very special offer for you on my Learn to Talk Dog 90 day program. I do hope you enjoyed the webinar. So if you haven't um been in, the, in a physical room with me before, then I'd like to introduce myself formally. Um, I'm Sarah Whitehead. Um, I'm a full member of the Association of Pet Behaviour Counsellors, and I'm also a very proud member of the APDT, the Association of Pet Dog Trainers um, in this country. And I feel um, passionately, actually, that behaviour and training go hand in hand, and um, that it's all very well being, being fantastic about sort of behavioural theory. Um, but the bottom line is that you've really got to be, you know, fantastic at training as well. Um, and so that's very important to me, actually, that, um, that I have both aspects to my career. And I'm, I've been amazingly lucky. I actually started um, my sort of full-time behaviour career with John Fisher, um, who I hope some of you um, remember personally. And I'm sure many of you will have um, at least know about him through his his brilliant books. Um, he was an amazing character, larger than life, and and really taught me so much. Um, and his his little expression, actually his favourite expression uh, that he had, I have in my head every single day that I deal with dogs and behavioural problems. Um, and that is, what is the practical application of that then? You know, he was a great Yorkshireman, and he really he really just wanted everything to be practical you know so he would um he would be fascinated by theory but he'd say you know what is the practical application of that then and you know really that's actually the sort of the methodology or the or the ethos if you like that i live by because i love theory too but unless i can actually make it work for me with with real life dogs and the people that they come attached to um then you know it's it's really only theory and that's uh, that's an important distinction to make um I now specialise in aggression um, in dogs and weird and wonderful behaviour problems in cats. Um, and I have um, five other people to my behaviour practice who see with me all different kinds of behavioural problems. Um, we see everything from, of course, from sort of control issues, separation problems, right way through to um, my speciality, which is really now seeing um, serious aggression cases. Um, so. I absolutely love what I do. I, I, I think that I have the best job in the world. Um, even having done it for, for more than uh, 20 odd years, um, I still, you know, can't wait to get up in the morning and do my job, which I, I think is, you know, really an amazing thing. And, I, and I'm grateful for it every day. Um, also write books. And um, some of you, I think, have, have um, met me through some books at some stage. Um, my most recent one, which is called Clever Dog, um, The Secrets Your Dog Wants You to Know. Um, is uh, is out in paperback. I do a little advert for it. There you go. Uh, and it even has five stars on Amazon at the moment. And I promise you, they're not all my mum going on and, and making a review. <laughs> um, so so that's fantastic. And actually, that book is the book that I've wanted to write, um, you know, really for many years. And um, it, it's, it's been a real cathartic um, experience for me, actually. I've loved writing the book and I also love hearing people's feedback about it. So if you've read it, I'd be very glad if you let me know. Um, so I'm also an NLP master practitioner, which is um, really human psychology, human cognitive psychology. Um, and I, I'm even qualified to hypnotize you. And I promise I won't on this call, um, but um, that's another string to the bow. And I think it's an interesting aspect because what it allows me to do is to, I hope, um, help the people that come with the pets um, more effectively than perhaps I, I would if I was really only about the dogs. And um, I know it's tempting, you get caught up in the dog side of things and you know it's tempting to kind of ignore the human end of the lead. But you know, actually, I really think that if you're going to do this job, you need to to like dogs and love people. You know, it's probably going to be more important because, uh, you know, it's the people that you need to influence the most. Um, so this evening, um, I thought really I'd, I'd kick off with um, a subject that is very close to my heart and it's obviously very close to lots of other people's as well because people keep asking me about aggression and that, what do we really mean by the signals of preemptive aggression? You signed up for a, a webinar with this fantastic title. What do we mean by it? 
Um, and what I'd like you to sort of think about is perhaps think about this um, in, a, in a slightly different way than you normally might when you think about aggression. And that is um, thinking about it in advance of it actually happening. So what I find is that a lot of people come to me with um, situations where their dog has been aggressive to them. And I, I see you know, really some of the worst aggression cases, um, both to humans and to other dogs. And very often, the people who are living with these, these dogs adore them, of course, and just didn't see the event coming. You know, it was a huge surprise to them when it happened. Um, and they just, you know, they say things like it came out of the blue, that the dog's never been like it before. Um, and actually, you know, the reality is they just had no clue that this was around the corner. And it upsets me primarily because, um, as I've said, you know, I, I, I like dogs. I don't just like dogs. I adore dogs. I'm passionate about dogs. Um, and I also really like people. And that means that for double whammy of, of aggression, it can just, you know, tear families apart, of course. So I'm really in the business, and I think many of you on the call are this evening too, of trying to prevent this happening as opposed to just us reacting when it does and what I think we really need to sort of spread the word about is the fact that these signals that happen before the dog is actually obviously aggressive are so important and that people just overlook them they just you know just don't realize what's happening now what I would like to say at this point is that I'm I'm constantly aware that you know myself and probably everybody who's listening watching this evening we are we are not normal people we are in a group of people who are really going to look much more in depth at our dogs and our dogs behavior than the vast majority of, of normal pet owners out there and I, I often describe in my master classes and, and things that actually um, most people live with their dogs like I live with my computer you know I want my computer just just to work I don't want to have to know how it works I don't want to have to keep you know, resolving problems. I don't want to have to do tons of maintenance in order to keep it working. I just want it to work. And when it doesn't, when it, it surprises me for some reason, um, then of course I, I have a, a little hissy fit and I, I contact, you know, some tech person and I say, just make it work again. Um, you know, I don't want to know how. I don't, I don't really want to spend time on it. Just make it work. And I think you know, from our point of view, it's a, a dilemma because obviously we are very interested in how dogs work, but the vast majority of kind of normal human beings out there probably aren't. And that means that actually the presence of things like stress signs where the dog is clearly uncomfortable in the situation um, and things like arousal, which the vast majority of normal people would just describe as excitement. Um, and when I use the word arousal, I don't necessarily mean sexual arousal, although that, that might be an element of the dog's arousal. Um, but people just don't see that th this is a problem until it's too late. So I think, you know, one of the things that we need to do is to make people very aware of uh, things like early stress signs, whether the dog is aroused or not, um, and, and what that means and how it might make a situation more risky. Um, and also how they can tell when the dog is heading into using a coping strategy, uh, which we describe as one of the four Fs. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. However, there is also something which is essentially um, ignored by huge numbers of people, including, I have to say, quite a lot of um, uh, sort of professionals, I think, which is actually that the signals of preemptive aggression, you know, the, the warning signs that aggression might occur in the future, are also um, indicated by a lack of proactive sociability. And this is one of the things that I think, um, you know, for, for most people is just not on their radar at all. They will see things like stress signs perhaps. Um, if they're really um, interested in the subject, they'll see and understand arousal. Um, they may understand things like the, the coping strategies. But for a, a pet or a pet dog in an ordinary family home that is not showing a lot of sociability um, in, the, in advance of it, um, happening, then this can make the factors much more risky. And I'm going to I'm going to talk about the um, the ways that you can spot signs of sociab sociability this evening. Uh, this is very important. Um, so just before we move on, though, I want to make it clear that 
there is a little caveat here, which is that some of the things I'm going to talk about, some of the pictures I'm going to show, maybe even some of the video clips, um, what I don't want you to do is have a, have a panic about it and say, oh, my word, my dog is showing one of these or two of these signs and symptoms. That means he's, you know, he's going to savage me. It's absolutely you know, not the case. Um, all of these aspects that we're going to talk about are just part and parcel of communication. Uh, so in exactly the same way as you know, your other half might um, you know, give you an eyebrow raise or a small frown, um, you hope that that doesn't develop in, into anything more serious. You know, if you live with another living being, you know, actually that, um, you know, warning signs are part of good, healthy communication. So what I don't want anyone to do this evening is to say, oh, panic, you know, I, I'm one of my dog's showing, you know, uh, one of these uh, signs, whale eye or something like that. And that means he's, he's, inherently a problem dog is absolutely not the case um, so you know please bear it bear that in mind as we go through this evening so I want to talk um, first and foremost about signs of sociability and as I mentioned I think this is kind of a best kept secret because um, they are, and uh, I love the way that um, Sue Sternberg from, from the States talks about this, uh, they are really a buffer to aggression and that's Absolutely, because if you live, again, as I've mentioned, with another living being of any kind, human or, or animal, the chances are that actually you are going to annoy that other living being and that other living being is going to annoy you at some point. In fact, you know, if we're really honest about this, don't other living human beings annoy you every single day, mildly? I mean, you know, there's not many people who don't get just slightly riled, you know, in traffic, in the supermarket, at home, you know, when he hasn't put the cap on the toothpaste or the toilet seat down or, sorry guys, I'm being sexist, but you, you kind of understand what I mean here, that this is really important that actually we don't kill each other because, um, you know, we said something that we shouldn't have done on the whole. Um, you know, and if you live with somebody else, it's the sociability that you have with them that is the buffer to aggression. Really important. It develops tolerance between living beings. And I think, and this is something that probably not many people have heard discussed before, that good quality and good quantity signs of sociability are a keep going signal. So I'm sure that most people have heard of a cutoff signal in dogs where, you know, perhaps one dog will, um, you know, perhaps he's been playing with another dog and it'll do something like um, you stop the play and have a little shake. And we call that a cutoff signal. And it's just taking a bit of a breather from the social interaction. That would probably be the best way I have of describing it. And signs of, of sociability are really the sort of the equivalent to the opposite of that. The signs of sociability say, keep going. I want you to keep doing whatever it is that you're doing. I want to have social contact with you, more social contact with you. And so I think, you know, those little signs and symptoms that say, keep going, whether that's to a human or to another dog, really important. And I've got a um, fabulous, this is probably my favorite clip, actually, of... Um, a dog. This is a dog that uh, we uh, were lucky enough to do some training with on one of our practical courses. And I hope that you can see the, the clip on your um, screen if you've got good enough broadband signal, um, as you can see it. And if you watch the dog, look how many fabulous social signals that this dog is giving. A uh, windmill tail, I know the dog could do with a good brush, but a windmill tail, a smiley face, squinty eyes, turning the face away, but also making lots of contact with um, his body. Look how he pushes his body into the human and says, you know, please keep going. This is what I like. This is what I enjoy. I want to have social contact with human beings. And, you know, this, when I see this, I, you know, I'm just full of admiration and respect for dogs because, you know, this is a dog that's in a very difficult situation in a rescue, waiting for a new home, which you'll be glad to know he's now got. But, you know, very difficult scenario, brought into a room full of people. And this dog shows fabulous signs of sociability. You know, this is this is just cracking stuff. Absolutely lovely. And tells you so much about, um, you know, that individual dog. Um, and if you're good at reading dogs in that way, then you can see how, you know, really the, the, a good description of those signs and signals is that they are a, a keep going signal. So I, I like to use that expression and particularly for people if you're if you're doing um, 
one-to-one -one training with with folks um, if you're explaining to somebody else in your family or your household or you're doing behavior consultations and you're explaining to clients what signs of sociability look like you can give them all kinds of sort of lists of things of you know what they physically look like but humans get it when you say that they're a keep going signal and i think that's a nice way of, of sort of explaining and putting it um, to people so in the last sort of uh, i guess uh, five years uh, one of the things i've been doing is to looking to look a lot at signs of uh, sociability in dogs that I'm able to uh, see video footage of because we can watch them over and over again and also um, I've started to sort of extend that a little bit and I had a, a bit of a theory that it's possible that it might just be that we can see signs of sociability in still photographs of dogs so not even just having to look at them in terms of video footage or, or when they're right in front of you, but actually in still photographs. And I started um, a little sort of uh, one, one woman campaign, if you like, where I looked at dogs um, that were up on rescue uh, center websites and I looked at still photographs of them. And then I went and visited as many as I possibly could to see whether um, they meeting the dog in person, if you like, matched what I th perhaps thought that the dog was saying in the photograph and you would think that it would be almost impossible to to do that just from a still picture um, but I I sort of started doing it got hooked on it got addicted and then actually started to get some of my students on courses to do the same thing as well and I think that we're kind of onto something that once your eye is trained uh, looking for social signals I think you can even pick them up in still photographs of dogs um, now I'm not saying that you should judge the whole dog's temperament character behavior everything else just by looking at a photograph absolutely not saying that um, you know this is this is this is not what I'm saying I don't want everybody to go away and say oh you know Sarah Whitehead says you can just tell everything about a dog from a photograph because clearly that's not true but in terms of a, a sort of a first look um, the best way of describing it is a little bit like internet dating that you know you, you can read all you like about the, the person but actually the photograph either appeals to you or it doesn't and I have to say that I have totally first-hand uh, knowledge and experience of this um, internet dating because this is now my dog <laughs> and I saw her picture um, on a rescue site and because I'd been uh, doing this sort of research and looking at still photographs and looking at photographs, I just saw this girl and that was that was it. I was in love. Um, you know, I, she, she came, you know, to me just really on the basis of this picture. Now, again, I'm not saying that you should home a dog on the basis of, a, of one still photograph. That would be craziness. But what this picture did for me is it made me say, I want to go and meet her. Um, I want to go and see what she's like with my dogs. I want to see if she's going to fit in as a, a good member of my, my family and my household. And so what was it about this particular photograph or these two photographs that caught my attention? And these are the original photographs of her as she was on, on the side. Um, and what I want you to look at is that she's sitting slightly crooked here you've got a kind of puppy sit which actually um you know with the hip out to one side which actually is a very s sort of sweetly vulnerable position for a, a dog to take even though she's um adolescent um, she's she's certainly no longer a puppy um, she's got what can only really be described as a human type of smile and dogs actually share this characteristic with us um, it's interesting that people talk a lot about uh, dogs and, and kind of smiles and um, pet owners um, you know, normal normal human beings out there that own dogs. If you say to them, "Does your dog smile?" They absolutely know what you mean. You don't have to explain it. They don't have to read a textbook uh, to know what you mean. Um, and this smile is, you know, is a really sort of characteristic one of a dog that actually, in this photograph, what I see is that she's not entirely comfortable. Um, I hope that you can see that she's got, you know, got her ears back a little bit, um, and she's got um, slight sort of. You can see a little bit of worry here. There's a tiny little bit of a kind of the eyebrows pulled together. Um, her facial muscles aren't totally relaxed, but actually her eyes are soft. Her body language is soft and she's doing this, you know, really sort of fabulous um, smile for the camera, which I think, you know, again, is absolutely equates to our own. So whilst a lot of body language and facial expression in dogs is not similar, some things are. Now, we don't have tails but if you look at her tail position here um, actually she's 
this is an interesting picture for me because she's um, possibly, we try not to talk about it in public, but she's possibly um, a cross between a collie and a husky. We don't know. Um, but she's got in sort of normal everyday life now with me where she's feeling very confident. This tail is carried high over her back um, in a really sort of um, Siberian husky type fashion. But here, it's just dropped slightly. So it's not between her legs. It's not um, held low, but it's just dropped slightly. So you know, everything about her demeanor in these pictures tells me that actually, if I was stood here, she would want to come forward and say hello to me and that she would be very sweet about the way that she did it. It would be very appropriate in the way that she did it. So I've given you some clues about these um, two pictures. And what I thought we should do now is I kind of like to play this little game. Um, and I call it snog, marry or avoid. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of pictures and you're going to tell me whether you would snog, marry and avoid or avoid. So this is our, our first candidate. And I'll give you a chance to sort of, uh, you can tell me whether you would snog, marry or avoid this particular girl. And I can tell you straight off that probably most people are saying exactly what I would, which is definitely a snog, if not a marry. And I'm so glad that actually so many people agree with me. That's fantastic. And why? Because like, look at her, her sweet face. Look at this smile. Again, she's not 100% comfortable. She says probably the camera is a little bit overwhelming, um, you know, the whole situation. She's actually um, a dog that I, this is a picture of a dog that I did um, take from a rescue center site. So she was looking for a home. And um, she's she's showing that she's, you know, not entirely 100% comfortable, the closed mouth, the fact that you can see, um, you know, this, the little sort of pinpricks where her whiskers come out show that there's some tension in the facial muscles here. But the lips are pulled right back into, you know, what we perhaps might describe as an appeasement smile. Um, but the eyes are soft. Again, I can just see that her body um, itself, although she's um, not in entirely relaxed, but she's not sitting square onto the camera. She's actually angled herself slightly. And this is a, a polite thing that people do too, actually. Um, next time somebody comes up and shakes your hand to introduce themselves, notice the fact that they don't come straight onto you. You know, they don't walk straight up to you and stand straight in front of you with their sort of um, chest square onto your chest, because that's kind of um, a little bit confrontational, a little bit threatening. Instead, particularly ladies, I have to say we are particularly good at this, we tend to go a little bit sideways um, in order to say hello. And that's kind of a polite thing to do. And it's pretty much cross-culture as well. Um, even in some of the other countries that I've visited, I've noticed that you know, pretty much across cultures, um, people use this slightly sideways greeting posture um, in order to be non-threatening. So, so that's one, one girl, it, just a bit of information um, from the rescue site. They said that she was between six and 12 months. And uh, you can see that she's she's a youngster. Um, what I like to are her, her jaunty ear angles, which I think are great. I can't quite tell if this one's um, sort of sailing in the wind. That's always a possibility. But again, although her ears aren't sort of, you know, uh, pricked up and forwards, you can see the insides of them. And you can you can just see that those um, the insides of the ears often show um, a sort of sign of sociability. That it shows that she's um, you know, wanting to make contact with a person. And again, if you imagine yourself standing here, what do you think she would do? I think she'd come forward and want to say hello and, um, and use lots of keep going signals to say that she would like you to um, make contact with her. So here is our next snog marine avoid. And um, this one's a little bit different. You can see some differences in the facial expression here in the ears and the eye contact. Um, so again, if you were going to have to choose snog, marry and avoid, um, it's going to just perhaps sway your decision a little bit because you're seeing some different things here, I hope. So although, again, we've got that sideways, uh, slightly sideways body posture, which is very sweet, you can't necessarily um, see her tail too well, but her tail is up here. So she's um, she's saying that, you know, that she wants to sort of do a... Um, at least a semblance of confidence with her tail position there. Um, her ears are back, but they're not pinned back to her head. And again, do you see the, the inside of the ear here? Um, that gives you a bit of information about the fact that she's showing these um, green flag behaviors, as um, Sue Sternberg likes to call them, which I think is a very good way of putting it. 
um, that it's a green flag that says yes in terms of keep going with sociability and keep going with social contact. Again, we've got a little smile here, but not as um, perhaps not as defined as the other dog that we just saw, and a little bit more worry. Do you see that here? That we've got a bit, a little bit more sort of anxiety or worry um, going on as her eyebrows are pulled together, and that's a really sort of classic sign of a bit of concern or a bit of worry. Um, and it's one, of course, that humans share. Um, you know, people, um, you know, if I was to ask you to make an expression of worry at me right now, um, it, it, immediately you pull your eyebrows together. Um, it's just what, what, what you do. It's just a sort of a universal signal of concern. And um, interestingly, her eyes here have more tension around them than the, the previous dogs, you, although they are, again, relatively soft, but actually what we see is a little bit more tension um, caused by the, the muscles around the eye. And so you get a wider, slightly more round eye rather than it being sort of perhaps almondy shape. And I know that, of course, um, there are going to be breed differences and type differences. And the way that dogs are put together uh, means that sometimes these uh, little subtleties of body language are perhaps more difficult to spot in some dogs than others. Um, but actually, if you get well practiced and good at seeing them, you, you pretty much can see them in you know across the board in all dogs. I think that um, you know it, it's a bit like sort of humans that actually we we all have very similar facial expressions, body language, cross culture, uh, but the, perhaps the way we use those is um, more culturally dependent. Um, and I think the same thing uh, goes for dogs that you might get sort of uh, cultural dialects almost in different breeds or, or types of dog. So if we bear social signals in mind, really what we're saying is that actually the more social signals that the dog has got, the more green flags that he's got, the less likely we are to come across problems if the dog is then um, upset by something, stressed by something, because we've got uh, the sociability there as a buffer to aggression. And I think if you get really good at reading um, good, healthy social signals in dogs, what it makes you very aware of is when they aren't there. Um, and that means that sometimes, um, and I know we've got quite a few people on the call tonight from um, rescue um, centres and rehoming centres. And, you know, I absolutely guarantee that all the people that work, you know, in those uh, scenarios, and hats off to you, by the way, um, you know, absolutely, you know, fantastic work. Um, but I can guarantee that everybody who, who works in those scenarios will be able to say that just sometimes they meet a dog and the, the dog hasn't done anything bad at all. It's, done, it's shown no signs of, of aggression, nothing overt that they could put their finger on. But there's something about the dog that makes them feel uneasy. And that sort of bit of gut feeling that you have about a dog, I think it's important you can kind of marry your head and your heart a little bit so that your head can say, what is it about this dog that's making me feel slightly uncomfortable? And I think the answer often is that it's a, a sort of a lack of these green flag signals, if you like, that matters. Um, and it, that's why it's making you, the, the dog is making you feel slightly uncomfortable. Um, and I, I can only describe it really in, in sort of human terms. Actually, if you meet a person who is seems to be perfectly um, polite and uh, pleasant and so on, but actually they show really no signs of sort of genuine friendliness or sociability, they can make you feel uncomfortable too. And, and I think, you know, it's something that's probably overlooked. We ask ourselves, you know, well, what did the dog do? It didn't do anything in particular. Um, it might actually be the, be the lack of something that it showed rather than the presence of something that it showed. So probably if there's one thing that I'd like you to kind of take away from this evening, it, it would be that, how important that is. Uh, moving on, though, we're going to need to think about the other preemptors, which are perhaps the, the more sort of um, uh, obvious ones in many ways. And those are um, things like stress signs, um, arousal, and the four Fs, which are the coping strategies that dogs might pick when they're under pressure. Um, so there are, as I'm sure you know, lots and lots of stress signs in dogs. And um, please don't panic. Don't try and write these all down. <laughs> this is certainly not even an exhaustive list. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of, um, of, of aspects on the, on the list of uh, stress signs and signals. And again, just to bear in mind what I said earlier, that you know, if your dog shows or dogs that you know show some of these things, um, please don't then immediately think, oh, my goodness, the dog is totally stressed out because actually a lot of these signs and, and signals on this particular list um, and others that would potentially come under the heading of stress signs uh, may well be shown at other times. And this is, I suppose, one of the reasons why 
Um, I'm fairly controversial. I I'm, I'm, uh, make no secret of it that actually I don't ever talk about calming signals in dogs. And the reason is that I think that it's a un slightly unfortunately misleading term in some circumstances. Um, because something like, for example, yawning um, may well be a sign of stress if the dog is in a situation where it's feeling under pressure. But don't you see your own dogs doing yawning at other times when actually you know 100% that they are not stressed? In fact, quite the opposite. They are excited or they are anticipating something fantastic. So I have video footage of my own dogs getting ready to go out for a walk and they are doing um, whining, they're doing yawns, um, they, one of them actually does sort of howling, you can imagine which one that is, that's the, uh, the, the collie cross possibly husky, and it would be very easy to look at my dogs when they're getting ready to go out for a walk, panting, pacing, um, you know, maybe doing some tongue flicking, to actually say to yourself, oh, oh gosh, they're all terribly stressed by the possibility of going out for a walk. And we, you know, if you live with these dogs, you'd know 100% that's not true. They're excited. So I think, in fact, quite a lot of the time when we're looking at um, what we might describe as stress signs, what we're really seeing is signs that the dog is getting ready, is, is making some sort of preparation, of course, unconsciously, it's not also a conscious thing, for action. And a dog that's getting ready for action, it might be because it's excited or it might be because it's stressed. So, you know, a little bit of, of thought about that there. Um, you know, if, if you're somebody who's, you know, previously been sort of, um, has perhaps read stuff about stress signals, really worth um, thinking about how actually they might mean other things. Um, you know, very important. And being able to isolate when it's stress and when it isn't is very important. So, Facial expressions give you lots of good clues and um, I want to say immediately that no dogs are harmed in the making of any of the, um, <laughs> the photographs or the, or the movies. Um, it's just, of course, that actually if you get a dog into a photo studio that's not used to being there, uh, quite frequently you'll see signs of a discomfort in the dog in terms of you know, emotional discomfort because it's just an environment that the dog has never experienced before. Um, and so from that point of view, actually, you know, sort of uh, professional photo studios are often the place where you see uh, stress signs in dogs. And what you can see in this um, little chap here, um, gorgeous cavalier, is actually a number of different a number of different things that show you that the dog's not feeling very comfortable. And I'm sure you can spot. I'm sure your gut instinct, for a start, tells you that that's the case. But when I look at him, what I see is um, a, a particularly long tongue. So you can see the dog is panting, um, and actually dogs that are panting because they're hot don't often pant with their tongues sort of lolling and um, and long. And it's called a spatulate tongue, um, like spatula that you'd um, use to make a cake with. Um, but you can tell I'm not a baker. Uh, but it's called a spatulate tongue, and it's where the tongue is sort of extended and long. Um, and combine that with the fact that actually what you see is um, the dog's um, lips are pulled back into quite a, um, a sort of striking um, uh, sort of muscle tension here. And this this point here, I'm going to teach you a new word this evening for those that you don't know. The point here in the corner of the dog's mouth is actually called the commissure, which I think is a fantastic word. Isn't that lovely? Trust the French to come up with something brilliant. This is the commissure, and it's it basically means the corner of the mouth. Um, but what you can also see here is if you're if you're good at noticing the, these sorts of things, the dog's whole body language actually is lowered. And that's the dog kind of not quite knowing what to do is caught in a bit of internal conflict about whether he ought to lie down and kind of lower his body language which would potentially make him feel like he's less threatening in the environment or prepare to to run prepare to move out of the way and very often where the dog's feet are pointing just like in humans where the feet are pointing is where their brain is because um, is, I was always told in my human psychology courses that actually you, if you want to know what a, a human is thinking about, you look at their feet. Um, because if their feet are pointing to the door, that's what they're thinking about. They're thinking about escape behavior, um, even if the rest of their body language is forcing them to stay in the room. Um, so next time you're in a meeting with uh, your boss, you can just glance down and notice what your own feet are doing. Um, it's always important when you're looking at pictures of dogs that you 
try if you can to ask yourself what am I seeing you know uh, the, the old catchphrase saying say what you see is an important one rather than um, saying I'm making an assessment about this dog's whole emotional state so here hopefully what you can say that you would see is furrowed brow wide eyes ears back smooth forehead Okay, so that would be very good, good and useful information um, for you to be able to relay to your brain from your gut instinct. And that way you can learn to sort of marry uh, your head and your heart when looking at dogs. Um, one of the things I do want to mention here is it's so important, actually, that we don't think very much as human beings. We don't think much about dogs um, having this sort of if you like extra sense and that is their sense of smell and I think we're we're absolutely on a sort of cusp of knowing so much more about um, what dogs can ascertain from scent and here's a dog with it doing a sort of classic tongue flick and when you see that the one thing you know for sure is that the dog is gathering more information from his environment he says he needs more information from his environment or she sorry in this case um, and that's allowing the dog to both taste and smell the scent molecules that have got sort of captured to the moist um, exterior of the nose. And the dog has this organ called the Jakobsen's organ in the roof of its mouth, and he can or she can actually taste um, the, the molecules of scent. Um, and so anytime when you see a dog that's saying, I need to do more information gathering, it should uh, sort of pop up in your mind as a little sign that says why does this dog need more information in this environment does she feel uncomfortable and actually the rest of her body language says yes she does uh, of course the little paw raise is very difficult to know without knowing about the context whether or not that's a little appeasement gesture or whether that's um, anticipation because some dogs will do that when they're just anticipating getting a treat so again you need to know about the context Here's one that um, probably for the vast majority of kind of normal human beings out there, they just wouldn't spot at all. And that's a um, very, very cute puppy, but showing kind of uh, low level signs that he really wants to keep this toy. So if you look at where the, the feet are placed, if you look at where the uh, mouth is placed over the toy and you see a little bit of whale eye. Um, and that's where you see the white of the eye. Nice little indicator that the dog says, actually, this is mine and I want to hang on to it. Um, Probably the reason, unfortunately, why people often get into trouble with their own dogs. Um, I've recently done a, a little uh, mini research project and we asked people to video their own dogs at home and then just uh, an analyse the footage for us and send it in and tell us what they thought was happening. And very, very interesting, out of um, sort of uh, 14 people that um, sent us inf you know, these, this information, the analysis and the footage, um, 10 of them actually had dogs that I saw doing very, very low level uh, resource guarding, but the, the people had no clue. Um, and I, I sometimes wonder if that's not what gets dogs into a lot of trouble, um, is, is the fact that the human just hasn't seen that the dog wants to hang on to whatever it is. And I'm sure you know people who will give a toy to their dog and then want to immediately take it back. Um, perhaps it's been this sort of whole... Um, you know, the whole idea about uh, dominance or the D word, as we now call it, um, in our society. And people think that somehow they have to possess the item that the dog has. And that may be what's leading uh, to so many dogs, I think, showing sort of some, some possession um, in their behavior. But that's probably for a whole other uh, webinar for another day. People around the world send me fantastic photographs and I always love it when somebody sends me one where they've got, oh, this is so funny. Um, and I just kind of hope actually that everybody um, who's looking at this picture would not go, that's hilarious. Um, because I look at it and in fact, it puts the hairs up on the back of my neck just slightly. Because yawns can mean, as I said earlier, many, many different things. They can mean anticipation. They can mean that the dog is stressed and upset. Um, what you can guarantee is that the dog is saying he needs more oxygen. That's what a yawn is. Um, I always like to go back to, you know, what's the point of this behavior for the dog? And nearly always there's some physiological explanation why a dog would, would behave in a certain way. And so yawning gains more oxygen into the system, which of course prepares you for flight or fight. And I find this picture both disturbing and fascinating because if you look at the little girl in the picture, um, she is clearly saying that she knows that this is not funny. This is this is not a friendly gesture from the dog. The dog is actually keeping her at, at paws length, in fact, um, and is is doing a display which is you know pretty 
full on. He's saying, here are my weapons. I don't want to have to use them. And again, you know, aren't dogs amazing that actually they don't? You know, they carry around this full set of weaponry uh, most of the time, and yet actually vast majority of the time they choose not to use them. This one's more subtle. Uh, this one is um, just the sign where actually you're seeing that the puppy's not comfortable with the proximity of the child and is doing a lovely little head turn and mouth close away from, away from the child, saying, I'm just turning my weaponry away from you. But you can tell from the dog's body posture and facial expression that actually is not comfortable um, with, with the little child there. Um, if you've not experienced sort of this kind of um, information before, I have to apologize, I guess, because this will immediately um, make you look at every single photograph you've ever seen of dogs and kids together <laughs> in a different way, um, which, you know, from my point of view is a good thing. But, you know, sorry to spoil all those uh, family photographs for you because you're going to go back through them and have a look at them and, and uh, probably see them in a different light, I'm guessing. So moving on, we're going to now look a little bit at arousal. And again, this is something that the vast majority, I've mentioned earlier, the vast majority of people just don't see as being um, something which would be, sort of, if you like, on the road to a potential risk or problem. And I think that's because the vast majority of people just see, see this sort of behavior. I'm going to show you a clip in a second of um, dogs being excitable you know i hear people all the time say say the dog's over excitable um or that he just um he's just a little bit out of control in certain situations and actually what i would look at with some of these dogs not all of them some of them is that actually what we're seeing is arousal and i want you to just look at the um, look at the clip and i want you to watch for a very specific thing which is actually escape behavior so what you see in this dog is that He's um, showing arousal with his, his owner, who's kind of restraining him a little bit. He shows lots of escape behavior uh, with his owner. See how he wants to use his teeth on his owner to try and make him move away? He then comes and says hello to me. This is preparing to do some filming, actually. And um, he's on the end of the lead. OK, he thinks he's going to get some, some good treats from me. But you can you see his annoyance at his owner's attempts at restraint here. And that's not making him a bad dog. It's just making him a dog that's aroused and is feeling trapped by his owner. And this is one of the sort of areas where I suppose if I saw this um, in a puppy in one of our puppy classes, I would actually want to address it as a problem before it became a problem. Um, because I'm sure that uh, most owners would just look at this and say, oh, it's just the dog being excited. But actually arousal means the dog is preparing for fight or fight or one of the other two Fs we're going to talk about in a second. So it's a, the dog's preparation, if you like, um, for that, which is, is really what makes it risky. And I think you know one of the dilemmas for, for us as, um, as humans is that we are so slow in comparison to dogs. You know, dogs are so fast that actually if they want to take evasive action, um, either in a sort of passive social way or in a less passive way, Actually, they do it so fast that we just don't have a chance to, you know, to really um, intervene at all. So the earlier we can spot these things is absolutely the better. Now, I mentioned the four Fs and pretty much everybody is going to have heard of flight or fight. Um, they're the ones that, you know, everybody knows about. And actually, you know, I think these days most people also will have heard of um, freeze, uh, which is, you know, just where the dog is um, effectively still for either a prolonged period or for a split second. And mini freezes actually are very difficult for, um, I think, kind of the average person to spot. Almost if you see um, a dog freeze and you think to yourself, was that, was that a mini freeze? Was that a split second freeze? The chances are that you're right. The dog did do a little freeze. And freeze is just sort of the body's response to, um, to a threat or a situation where the dog or person thinks that they may be under pressure and it's probably just um, a, a, an unconscious response um, that says if I freeze perhaps they won't see me you know it's kind of what mice do when uh, my one of my cats is after them poor things and flight is again a kind of an obvious one that most people understand and uh, you know it's about all about running away except that I see flight a lot where it's much more subtle. So if you look at these two characters, I mean, I do love this picture, but if you look at these two characters, actually what you see when you really look closely is that the dog's eyebrows are furrowed, his body is hunched, he's preparing for um, escape, and that he's leaning away slightly 
uh, from the little girl. So this is flight, but in its most subtle form. And I think it's a good thing to, to practice looking for, for those sorts of subtleties. Um, the flirt or fiddle about option um, can come in many different forms. And nearly always it comes in a form where the dog is actually trying to be really polite and saying, um, you know, I don't want to have to, to go to the next level. I don't want to have to, you know, be cross with you, human. But actually, you're putting me in a situation which I really, really don't like. And um, I have no um, excuses for using this video clip because I, I just love this dog's um, avoiding actions. Um, his owners want him to have a bath. So they managed to get him into the bathroom. And what I want you to do is to look at the dog's facial expression, body language, and where the dog keeps looking too. Little shake off. Lip licking, tongue flick, half a yawn. And if you're able to notice what he's doing the whole time is looking for an escape route. More lip licking, some tail wagging. Vocalization. I think he doesn't want to have a bath. That would be my professional guess. <laughs> so here, actually, what you see is that very often you actually see several different um, aspects of it all at once. So you might actually see a little bit of flight, you know, he was trying to escape, and a little bit of flirtation where he's trying to say to the human, oh, come on, I'm so cute, look at me. Of course, you don't want to put me in the bath. Um, and you might see a little bit of freeze. And so it's the, it's the combination of things that you need to look for when, when you're looking at context. So uh, the lesson here being dogs don't like bars, I think is probably <laughs> fairly, fairly apparent. Okay, so just before we um, move on to the uh, to my list of the eight stages of progression towards aggression, um, and also the sort of the more, most dramatic of the four Fs, which is is the fight response, um, I just wanted to give you um, a little bit of information about the project that I've been working on for the last three years, and it really has been sort of a labour of love, um, and that's my 90-day um, online training program in dog body language and facial expression. Um, and I just wanted to sort of mention it at this point because as a kind of thank you for being on the call with me tonight, um, I want to make you a, a sort of a VIP special offer um, on it, uh, which I'm going to do at the end of the, the call this evening. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information, there are three modules to the to the program. And even if you're um, sort of thinking, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a trainer, I'm an instructor, whatever, um, if you can let other people know about this, I'd be very grateful because... Um, the first module is really about canine vocabulary, and it's about all the sort of the critical basics, but it's not um, just about the sort of fundamentals. It's a lot about the subtleties of body language and facial expression. And really, I guess my aim for this is that it will help to keep dogs out of trouble. Um, the second one is about recognizing the four Fs and the coping strategies. And again, my aim for this is to make sure that actually owners can spot um, these these sort of signs and symptoms early on, so that they never have the dog never has to go into the next stage. And um, the social signal side of it, I think, as I've mentioned earlier, is really um, best kept secret. Um, and so I've actually uh, gone really gone to town on this one, and I've got um, 18 different lessons in this particular module, um, which is all about social signals in dogs. And also, um, which is actually kind of a special, if you like, which is the early warning systems as a bonus module, and that's talking about fear stress, anxiety and appeasement. And certainly um, if you're a professional or a student um, of animal behavior or work in rescue or uh, veterinary staff, that's the one I know that, um, that you'll want to, to look at. Um, so 
just a little bit about it. It's an, a 90 day um, online training program. It's, it's completely unique in as much as it's all online. So you sit in front of your own computer, um, a bit like you're doing this evening, but you don't necessarily have to have me in your ear. And um, you look at the pictures and the videos um, that I've put together on the, the program. And then you can um, actually interact uh, with the site by doing a little quiz at the end of each sec uh, section so that you can see how you're doing. And that um, quiz is certainly not a test or an exam. It's entirely between you, me and your computer. Um, but it gives you a chance to sort of see, you know, well, how, how many did I get? Did I get six out of 10? Did I get, you know, 100%? Um, and so people, I've had some lovely feedback about that. People have really enjoyed doing the, the course. Uh, my priority really is that actually as a result of it that you'll be able to assess dogs more rapidly um, and for me that's about safety. So really important I think that one of the, the best things that I've learned over the years and one of the things I try and if I can communicate to my students is how to assess dogs really fast um, so that you basically can keep yourself out of trouble and reduce stress for the dogs. Um, marry your head and your gut instinct which is the thing that I was talking about earlier, um, really important and I think set yourself apart a little bit from other trainers. Um, I think, um, you know, I've, I've always been, um, you know, a bit self-conscious about this, but I think it's really important that actually if you're somebody um, who is, you know, has the ethos of the dog um, at heart, the dog and owner combination at heart, then actually you owe it to them to set yourself apart from trainers who perhaps don't have quite the same positive ethos. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I've got really unequivocal about saying that that's an important thing. You know, we should be shouting from the rooftops about positive methods and about being able to assess dogs correctly because it helps to save dogs. And that's, you know, that's my driving force every single day when I get up in the morning. Um, so if you're like me and you immediately want to know, well, what's the price? <laughs> let me let me put you out of misery. Um, all four modules, actually, three modules plus the bonus, normally £297. But um, I'm going to do you a fantastic offer. I sound like a market trader, but I don't I don't mean to be. It's a genuine thing. This is I'm not a salesperson. This is absolutely genuine um, that I just I just really want to um, give everybody on the call tonight an opportunity um, to take the course. And also, you know, to give me feedback on the course is fantastic. So that's kind of my ulterior motive, if you like. So I want to go back now to our progression towards aggression. And these really are what I would regard as being the eight stages. And we've already talked about um, actually the sort of the one that even comes before number one, which is about uh, sociability or lack perhaps of social signals in dogs. And I think it's really important that we, you know, we spread the word about that. Then we go into the stress signs, which we talk about arousal and the four Fs. And then really at number four, this is, um, if you like, what I think makes the difference between a dog that is going to be um, caught in indecision and a dog that's actually going to take some proactivity towards escalating um, his his defensiveness and that is um, how the dog shifts his body weight or about the space that the dog takes and actually if you watch dogs together this is such a fundamental thing between two dogs when they when they first meet um, this is all about who takes what space um, and again I'm going to quote Sue Sternberg on this because she talks about dogs being in a bubble and the other dog sort of leaning into the bubble and what that might mean. And I think that's really important because actually, um, again, human beings are very good at this. We tend not to invade other people's space, um, even in, in <laughs> perhaps uh, cultures that are um, less restrained or reserved than, than, um, than British ones. Um, actually, even you know, in, in very um, sort of physically intimate cultures that, that are more likely to do sort of kissing when they when they greet and that kind of thing, you'll still see that people respect each other's uh, space. Growls and barks, a vocalization comes next. And then we're into perhaps the more obvious things, which is um, snarling or showing teeth. Um, you know, as soon as the dog's got its weaponry out, you can say that there's absolutely no doubt that there's escalation. Um, and then there's the lunging and air snap, where the dog snaps in the air or snaps towards the, the person or to the, the other dog or whatever, it's frightening it, but there is no contact. And absolutely, let me tell you, I have um, video footage of dogs uh, biting people, unfortunately, um, and in those clips, when they're played at real time, you cannot tell how many times the dog has bitten the person. But slow down to, you know, perhaps only something like, you know, 10 frames a second or something like that or, or less, Actually, what you then see is that the dog has made contact not just once, but you know repeatedly. 
So the bottom line with this is really that if a dog wants to bite somebody um, or something, it can and it will. They are so much faster than us. And so when owners tell me things like, you know, oh, well, I, um, I just got in the way, um, you know, the dog didn't mean to bite me, or um, the opposite, which is, um, you know, I moved out of the way and I avoided a bite. I, I kind of do a little bit of an inner uh, smile and nod because actually, um, you know, if, if, if you do any form of sort of training with your dogs, you will know how fast they are. They are, you know, really supersonic speed compared to us. And the final one here, which is, a, is bite, um, seems like an obvious thing. But the, I hear an awful lot talked about bites and bite levels. And again, I'm going to be a little bit controversial for you here this evening um, because I quite like that. Um, and because what I want you to do is for, is for you to go away and think about this, some of these things in the bath. Um, I hear a lot about bite levels being um, linked to whether or not the dog has broken skin when it's, when it's bitten. And um, for those people out there who are perhaps students of behavior or, or, or uh, dealing with behavior in some way, um, however that might be, I will absolutely tell you that I do not believe that the severity of the bite is linked to necessarily linked to broken skin. Um, I've actually seen uh, pictures of um, animals, large mammals, things like um, deer and um, unfortunately other animals like sheep, um, cows, um, donkeys, um, horses, and on one really horrific occasion, um, human, who had all been killed by a dog or dogs and who had no broken skin at all. Um, the damage that the dog can do um, subcutaneously is so immense um, that I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that um, the, the definition of a severe bite is uh, broken skin. So I'm just going to leave that one with you. Hopefully it won't give you nightmares. That's not the intention. Um, it's, it's really just to give you some sort of thoughts about that because I hear it said an awful lot and actually I think that um, you know, perhaps we need to review our sort of our ideas about that a little bit. But of course, what we're in the business of doing is trying to prevent um, dogs ever getting to that stage. Um, so in this clip, what I would really like you to do is to look for these stages and think about what you're actually seeing as opposed to what you're interpreting. And what I have to do right away before you before I even play the clip is to give you a little bit of a mental health warning on it, um, because you will immediately, um, I'm afraid, want to probably um, grab the owners and do them damage um, because they are prob probably not behaving in a way that you would hope that they would behave. Um, and so it's pretty unfortunate for the for the poor dog in this situation. Um, but let me tell you that nobody, nobody was injured, um, which is a really good thing. Um, I feel terribly sorry for the dog, but I do, I do put out a mental health warning before, in, in advance, um, you know, just so that you don't want to um, drown the owners, which is, is possibly what might make you want to do. It seems to be bath night tonight. I don't quite know why we've got dogs who always want to, owners who want to bath their dogs. So straight away, I'm hoping that you're seeing <laughs> Even before that happened, you're seeing signs that say the dog is not comfortable. And see how the dog is having to escalate this here? That was actually a bite, it was inhibited, but the dog did, did catch her. Whale eye, vocalizations, tail wagging to disseminate information, scent information. Snarl and snap, seeing the weaponry at the front. Again, little appeasement gestures where the back leg comes up again to try and disseminate more scent information.
So really a combination of all the things actually that we've um, talked about this evening. Little displacement behavior there. Tongue flick. So that's enough of that one because it kind of makes my um, hackles go up a little bit. Um, but hopefully you, you could see lots of those different signs and signals there um, and also how fast it moved from, if you like, stage one uh, to stage eight. Um, so I suppose really from the, the bottom line on this is that the more you can spot these signals early, the more chance you have of actually being able to prevent situations and to be able to educate people about what they're seeing in those early stages. Um, so I hope you can put that one behind you and not have nightmares about it. Um, I think um, probably the chances are that you uh, came on the call this evening because you're really interested in um, animal behaviour and dog behaviour in particular. And I'm just going to very briefly, because I got told off last time by a couple of people who said in, really interested in your Learn to Talk Dog 90 day program, but wanted to kind of know a little bit about what's in it um, before signing up, which is absolutely sensible, of course, or before perhaps recommending it to somebody else. Um, and so just very, very briefly, um, just give you a little bit of clue about what's in each one. This is module one, canine vocabulary, and lots of different aspects in there about all the sort of most, what I think are the most important, most fundamental things that you're going to see or most people are going to see in their dogs. Um, so things like the myths about play bows, um, how when you see a dog bow, it's not always about play, uh, really important. Lots of different meanings of yawns um, and what tail wagging is all about from a canine perspective. And in fact, um, one of the things about the, um, the course is that I'm constantly updating and adding to it. So in fact, I went online this afternoon and added four more video clips of, um, of different types of tail wags. and um, have got sort of annotated notes about them all so that you can see um, a little bit about you know perhaps what the dog is saying um, in in all different contexts uh, so there's 10 lessons to that that very first one and the second one which is about the four f's again 10 lessons um, and in this one i talk quite a bit about um, why aggression or how aggression can end up being a habit um, and not emotional at all. And I think this is one of the dilemmas that people often have when they're dealing with um, aggression problems, either in their own dogs or helping other people with theirs, um, is that very often what we think um, should be working, you know, we're clicking and treating the dog for the absence of the behavior, for example, or clicking and treating the dog um, for, um, you know, being in the presence of other dogs and, um, you know, really sort of working on that, making sure the dog feels more relaxed and more comfortable. And yet still there are times where that doesn't seem to 100% work. And I think that actually nearly all of those have come down to um, the fact that actually the, the, the aggression itself has become a non-emotional habit in terms of it. No, it's no longer fueled by fear. Um, and in fact, I do think that there are some dogs that once they get good at aggression, they actually start to enjoy it. Uh, and they may start to enjoy it at a neurochemical level, not just at a, a sort of emotional level, if you like, or a mental level. Um, and those ones can be, you know, potentially very difficult to resolve, but they're impossible to resolve if you don't recognize that that's what's happening um, right from the outset. Um, the third one, which is this all about the social signals, probably my favorite one. I absolutely love showing people um, ways that tell uh, ways that you can tell that a dog wants to keep going with his interaction with you. And um, I think, you know, this this is the one that I've, I've just loved doing. Um, and you even have, which is probably worth the cost of the course alone, um, footage of my own dog doing what I describe as love nibbles um, on the course because I just couldn't resist it. I'm afraid that was a self-indulgence. Um, but again, really important that people understand um, how to tell that a dog wants to start to have contact with you and maintain it. Uh, because if they're saying they don't want to, to maintain it, they're not showing these keep going signals, then that on its own is a little warning sign. So it's the absence of these things that really matters. Um, and finally, the bonus module, which is early warning systems. This is the one, of course, that's, that's most closely related to aggression and is, again, um, absolutely the one that I have loved writing. Um, it's, it's taken me pretty much the, the, the nearly three years, in fact, to gather all the footage together, um, tons and tons of um, video footage and photographs, um, looking at, in more depth in those eight steps of aggression that we've talked about a little bit about this evening, um, and also about some sort of fairly unusual things like um, how mounting um, in dogs is, is not necessarily about 
sex or hormonal status, um, you know, what it can mean and, um, and how to, again, make an assessment of it um, so that you can really, um, you know, either help that particular dog or help the owners of that particular dog. And there are 15 lessons um, in this particular uh, module. Um, there are little quizzes at the end of each module. So, um, you know, hopefully people would really enjoy those because that's, uh, that's, that's your chance to shine, your chance to go on and get 100%. And um, I'm always hugely impressed if you manage to do that. Um, and I did say that, you know, as a, as a sort of big thank you for you sticking with me this evening, um, not disappearing off to watch the gorgeous Paul Hollywood on the, on the baking early, um, is that I'm just going to do a, a very quick VIP offer. And when I say it's quick, I mean it's quick because um, it's only going to be valid until six o'clock tomorrow. Um, and that there's kind of good reason for that, which is that um, I want to really you know, spread this as, as much as I possibly can um, to as many people as I possibly can, um, but on kind of a limited offer because the rest of the time it is going to be um, £297. And so from six o'clock tomorrow evening, it will go back to being £297. Um, but this is special for you, £97 if you sign up before six o'clock tomorrow. You can let other people know about it as well. I've had some fantastic feedback from people that have already been on um, the programme. Uh, when we launched it um, back in July, and um, you can see testimonials and things about um, uh, you know from them online as well. So that only leaves me to say that I very much hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. Um, I've very much enjoyed your company for the last hour or so. And um, if you want to take me up on the special offer, uh, you can just click on the link or go to the URL, which is learn to talk dog forward slash special offer. Um, and I hope very much that I'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening. Learn to talk dog with Sarah Whitehead. That's my mum.